Ladies and gentlemen, I am Richard Hingley. My name may not be as readily recognizable as those of some of my contemporaries, such as Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, or my good friend George Washington, but it is one that has been associated with some of the most consequential historical and political events of the last nearly 40 years. If you will allow me, I would like to summarize my, my public career, not only for your own edification, but also in an attempt to salvage from near obscurity my reputation and legacy. But to do so, I must start at the beginning. And when Ali speaks of the beginning, he is speaking of the year 1640, for that was the year that our family patriarch, Richard, first arrived in Virginia. He came here with a, a land patent of, of 1,000 acres on the north bank of the York River in what is now Gloucester County. By the time of his death, he was the largest landholder and wealthiest man of Virginia, rising to the highest echelons of colonial government. His son, also named Richard, relocated the family seat from the banks of the York River to, to what is now called Virginia's Northern Neck. Not only did he remove the family geographically from the Tidewater, but also reoriented the family's financial interests away from that region and its wealthy planter class. The, the next lead note was the third son of Richard the Younger, Thomas, my father. Through hard work and natural intelligence, Thomas distinguished himself in business and colonial politics. To reflect his, his wealth and his status, he constructed a home for himself, a, a monumental statement of brick, which he called Stratford Hall. It was here at Stratford Hall that I was born on January 20th, 1732. The fourth surviving child and third son of my parents. At the age of 13, I was sent off to England to begin my formal education. And then at the age of 19, both my parents died, requiring me to return to Virginia to claim my meager portion of the family inheritance. While my eldest brother, Philip, tended to the family business, I continued my education, availing myself of my father's vast library. From the works of the immortal law, I gained an ardent fondness for the principles of a free government, and from other writers, I drew maxims of civil and political morality. These writings greatly influenced my thinking regarding the, the rights of man and the virtues of a republican form of government. My first overt interest in politics were inspired by the mother country's insufficient attention to Virginia's defenses during her war with France and its Indian allies, and the failings and ingrained inefficiencies of Virginia's colonial assembly, the, the House of Burgesses. I was elected to the House in 1757, and I was determined to challenge the ingrained aristocracy of the Tidewater elites, which was embodied in the person of John Robinson, who for 20 years had served as both the treasurer and the speaker of the House of Burgesses. Because he controlled both his purse strings and the legislative agenda, Robinson was the most powerful politician in all of Virginia. I, as one of my first legislative acts, entered a bill that would have separated those two offices. Now this bill failed to pass. And because I challenged the, the status quo, I earned the ire of my intended target as well as his political allies. Undeterred, I aimed my reform efforts in a in a different direction, the slave trade. I proposed a resolution that would have laid such a heavy duty on that iniquitous and injustice practice 
that would have ended the slave trade in Virginia. This too failed to pass, and the animosity towards me grew. For years it had been rumored that Robinson was using the, the public treasury to enrich himself as well as his political friends. Because of this, I called for an inquiry to the state of the treasury. It was only later, after Robinson's sudden death, a year later, that my suspicions were validated when an examination of his state showed that he had indeed been using the treasury as his own personal bank account. My attacks on the establishment endeared me to the, the common people of Virginia, solidifying my support. After the War with France, the Parliament in London passed a series of measures that infringed upon colonial rights. The most odious of these was the Stamp Act. I vowed to resist British policies by all ways and to every extremity. I drafted what was called the, the Westmoreland Resolves, which was a compact of citizens to fight the Lowson Stamp Act. I organized boycotts of the importation of British goods, as well as the exportation of Virginia raw materials to British markets. And I proposed a committee of correspondence among the, the patriots in the various colonies to help coordinate continent-wide resistance against parliamentary injustices. These, these measures helped to solidify my reputation as a leader in Virginia's patriot movement. In the fall of 1774, a Congress was called in Philadelphia. I was selected to be one of the delegates representing Virginia at this first Continental Congress. And while there, the, the body adopted my plan for a continental-wide boycott of British goods and agreed to meet again the following May if our grievances had not been addressed. Well, it was, it was no surprise to me when the, the King and Parliament ignored our pleas, making a second meeting of the Continental Congress necessary at the appointed time. Once again, I was selected to represent Virginia at this Congress. And while there, I and other like-minded patriots, such as Jefferson, John, and Samuel Adams of Massachusetts, we pushed for a separation from the mother country. It was my great honor to have introduced the resolution on independence into Congress on the 7th of June, 1776. But I was not there for the subsequent discussions and debate on the resolution nor was I there for the, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. I did not affix my signature to that document until many months later. My brother Francis, he also signed the Declaration as he too was a member of Congress. We were the only two brothers to have signed the Declaration of Independence. I left for Philadelphia for Williamsburg shortly after introducing the Resolution on Independence into Congress. The royal governor, Lord Dunmore, had recently fled the colony, leaving the province without functioning government. I and George Wythe were, were asked to drop a new constitution for Virginia, the constitution that the legislature finally adopted, greatly resembled the plan that Wythe and I had presented. After ensuring the establishment of a new government for a free and independent Virginia, I returned to Philadelphia to reclaim my seat in Congress. For the next three years, Congress was marked by bitter infighting and petty rivalries among its members, which at times threatened to end the dream of American independence. I was, I was often at the, the center of this storm. My, my political enemies accused me of all forms of misconduct. It was said that I was involved with a, a conspiracy of army officers and, and other members of Congress to have General Washington removed as commander in chief. It was also claimed that I was attempting to weaken Virginia's wartime currency. All of these stories were, 
were contemptuously wicked, spoken with a poisonous tongue of slander. I vehemently defended myself in the press and before the legislature in Williamsburg. Although I was ultimately victorious in clearing my name, the, the protracted struggle left me weakened both physically and emotionally, and I resigned my seat in Congress out of disgust and exhaustion. Returning back to Virginia, my attention was concentrated mostly on, on local issues, such as helping to plan the defense of the state, as well as serving as the, the Speaker of the General Assembly for a brief time. I also stood unsuccessfully for governor. Then in 1784, the legislature returned me to Congress, I believe partially in an, an attempt to be rid of me. At this time, the states were operating under a, the loose association constructed by the, the Articles of Confederation. Because of my experience serving in Congress, I was not sure that that institution had the ability to exercise effective government. But the, despite my misgivings, I was still honored when I was selected to serve as President of Congress. Because the Articles of Confederation had no chief executive, this position made me the, the de facto President of the United States. My greatest achievement while serving as President of Congress was ensuring the passage of the Land Ordinance of 1785, which opened up for sale and settlement the 10 million acres of the Trans-Appalachian West, providing much needed revenue for our depleted national coffers. After the Land Ordinance had passed, the precarious state of my health required me to once again retire from Congress and return to Virginia. But I, I was not idle long. In January of 1787, the states were asked to send representatives to a convention in Philadelphia for the purpose of amending and revising the Articles of Confederation. The governor asked if I would attend this convention, but I declined this honor, instead accepting another appointment to Congress. I, perhaps better than most, having served as President of Congress, knew the limitations of the Articles of Confederation. I agree that alterations to the Articles were necessary, but I was not of the opinion that they had failed. The, the proceedings in Philadelphia were kept secret, even from Congress. When we were finally presented with the results of the deliberations from the Philadelphia Convention, Many of us were surprised that it constituted an entirely new plan for national government, not just the revisions of the articles as we had been told. I believe that the, the Philadelphia plan had many excellent regulations in it, and if allowed to be reasonably amended, would make a fine system. One, uh, one objection I had, as did many, was the lack of a Bill of Rights articulating protections for our most sacred liberties. I also suggested the addition of a, a Privy Council to act as an a advisory body for the President. And I thought that the, the requirement of the Senate to approve presidential appointments was a dangerous blending of legislative and executive powers. All of my suggested amendments to the Constitution were intended to improve that document. But there were some in Congress that mistook my motives as, as opposition to the adoption of the Constitution, which was not the case. The, the criticisms of me in this regard became so strident that I began to question the, the motives of my detractors. Soon my, my support for the Constitution in any form began to wane not because of its structure, but because of the character of the men who supported it. All of my suggested amendments were rejected in their entirety and without debate. The fight against the Constitution now reverted to the states where it had been sent for ratification. 
I returned to Virginia to, to lobby the legislature against ratifying the Constitution. Uh, I wrote a pamphlet for the people of Virginia to discuss my reservations regarding the Constitution. And because of this, I was attacked with venom and lies in the press. Not only did the, the debate over the Constitution divide Virginia and the country, but it also divided my family, as both my brother Francis and my son Thomas supported ratification. My health began to fail due to the stress of the situation. So I removed myself from any further public debates on the Constitution. In the end, my, my views did not prevail as Virginia ratified the Constitution in June of 1788. But I still intend on finding ways to improve the document, as well as to ensure that the promised Bill of Rights would be added. I let it be known to, to friends of mine in the legislature that I would welcome an appointment to the new Senate if one was offered, which it was. I was one of the first two senators from Virginia under the new Constitution. The, the proceedings and sessions of the Congress in those first early decades, or excuse me, the first early sessions, um, concentrated on, on adding meat to the skeleton of the new governmental system. We passed legislation that uh, further defined the powers of the executive branch, as well as created the framework for a federal judiciary. I also led a fight against attempts by northern states to increase the, the ratio of congressmen to citizens, an attempt to bridge the representation of the, the South while adding to that of the North. Towards the end of my term, I was selected to serve as President Pro Tempore of the Senate when the Vice President, John Adams, stepped down to take a temporary leave of absence. When my time as President of the Senate ended, the precarious state of my health once again required me to resign from the service of my country but this time for good. Now I believe that represents a, a reasonable summary of my, my public career. One that I hope you would agree is worthy of remembrance to posterity. Thank you very much.